Guys, welcome to another episode of The Pulse. Always talking to people who are doing cool things, impacting the world, but I can honestly say I have never spoken to anyone as I go down the list, uh, authored nearly 100 books, dozens of New York Times bestsellers, named to the top 100 influencers in the entire world of the last century. 20 million fans on social media, number 17 in the world as influential thinkers. We have the pleasure of speaking to Dr. Deepak Chopra. How are you, sir? I'm great. How are you? Do even you kind of hear some of the things you've been able to accomplish in your life and go, wow? Well, you know, it just happened. I never planned anything. I just pursued my passion for healing and understanding fundamental reality. And I shared it with the world and there we are. Uh, it wasn't something that I was doing out of ambition or exacting plans or as I said, uh, because I wanted to be famous. I was just sharing my ideas and some people uh, responded. And that seems to be a perpetual surprise to me even now. now obviously, we introduced you as Dr. Deepak Chopra, but I, I was not as familiar with your medical standard medicine background. Now, so tell us a little bit about your background, how you got here. I mean, you're, you're licensed, uh, studied, medical doctor i still am i teach at mount sinai medical school in new york and i teach at the university of california medical school at uh, in san diego i have a faculty appointment at the medical school in lake nona in florida so i haven't given up that my training was in internal medicine and then in endocrinology which is the study of hormones and then after that neuroendocrinology which is looking at the molecules of emotion in the brain. That led me to what is now called integrative medicine. And then I, I went a little deeper beyond that because I realized that mind and body are not fundamental reality. Fundamental reality is what we call consciousness or awareness or to use a layman's term, spirit. And that is the most challenging area to now explore, both philosophically and scientifically. Was it hard for you when you started branching off into things that, in some ways, standard medicine question? Standard medicine is based on reductionism, which means you look at the mechanisms of disease and then you figure out how to interfere with that. So you look at how bacteria multiply, and then you figure out you know, which antibiotic to use. And that works in acute situations. We shouldn't deny that standard medicine saves lives. But when it comes to chronic disease, you know, diseases like heart disease or cancer or autoimmune illness or Alzheimer's, a lot of that has to do with looking at the body as a whole and not just looking at the body, but looking at the mind, at emotions and even our spiritual awakening as components of everyday experience. So ultimately, what we call a physical body is the culmination of all the experiences we have, not just eating and breathing and behaving, but everything from sensory experience to perception, to thoughts, to feelings, to emotions, to imagination, to our sense of self, to our biological rhythms. All this influences our body through a mechanism called epigenetics. So only 5% of disease is due to what are called fully penetrant genes that guarantee the disease. Even for that, there's a major breakthrough in standard medicine. It's coming, it's called gene editing. You'd be able to cut and paste genes in the same way as you cut and paste emails, and that will get rid of the 5% of disease that is genetically determined. With all the science we have in genetics, in epigenetics, microbiome, consciousness, and much, much more, what I was saying 40 years ago is slowly becoming mainstream science. And that's what I teach at the medical schools too. Was there a period of time for you when you're going through your training, when you're practicing standard medicine, was there kind of a aha moment for you when you realized you needed to be going down a different path than what everybody else was teaching? 
Yeah, it was my training. I was looking at the molecules of emotion. I was working with brain scientists. And the aha moment was wherever thought goes, a molecule goes with it. So you cannot separate the mind and the body. They are a unified experience in our own consciousness. So those aha moments were in the lab with working with colleagues who were looking at the same thing. Coming up next, years of criticism. It was hard, but it ultimately, it helped him grow. My critics uh, are, in a way, good friends of mine because I can learn something from even their criticism. Sometimes it's valid and sometimes it's not. I know you're, you're probably familiar with Ianla Van Zandt. Yeah, I know her well. She's a good friend. So Ianla, I grew up with Ianla. She used to work in, oh. in radio with my family. I joke with her that people expect Ianla to fix their life, like when she meets them, because that's her, her thing. How many people ask you or expect you to heal them inside of a 15-minute conversation? Yeah, a lot, but I <laughs> tell them I can point the way, only they can heal themselves. Ultimately, you can only give uh, directions to what you know as a mind-body expert, but ultimately all healing is dependent on the person themselves. They have to have the knowledge, but they also need to have the experience. I'm like a policeman direct showing <laughs> direct traffic. So it's hard to just go to dinner. <laughs> Somebody yeah. sees you and like, oh, there he yeah. is. I've been yeah. having this problem with fill in the blank. Yeah, that's true. And it has led to an extreme level uh, of popularity, an extreme level of curiosity from people. Um, but it also led to, as I was doing some research, people who just made it their purpose to try to criticize and discredit the things that you were saying. How do you cope with something like that? You've been doing it for years. Yeah, I, I used to take it seriously, but then I realized, actually, first, if I took it too seriously, that would uh, interfere with my work. But on the other hand, I also realized that your critics sometimes have uh, good things to point out and that they can serve as a feedback. So I changed my attitude to regarding my critics uh, as my best friends from whom I could learn something. And that's my attitude now. My critics uh, are, in a way, good friends of mine because I can learn something from even their criticism. Sometimes it's valid and sometimes it's not. People have been much more open to the concept of alternative forms of medicine and healing yourself and, uh, and what have you. Why do you think that message resonates so deeply with so many people? It resonates intuitively with people because they've had these experiences. It resonated with me as a physician because I couldn't explain sometimes why some people recovered when they were not supposed to and why some people died when they were not supposed to. So, you know, I started listening to the stories of my patients and finding some validity to their experience. At that time, there was no science. But now, 30 years later, science, neuroscience and epigenetics and microbiome and artificial intelligence give us access to not only people's experiences, but how to validate that scientifically. So it's a process. You know, the problem is our medical training until recently doesn't focus on mind, body or spirit. It only focuses on basically the physical aspects of our biology. But yet our biology is not just physical. We use our biology to express emotions, experience emotions, and self-reflection and thought and spiritual experience, all are part of our biological organism. What has changed? Like what has gotten better that you feel like you were saying so many years ago that people are now accept accepting? Every experience you have, thoughts, feelings, emotions, desires, imagination, transcendence, prayer, meditation, any experience you have is now measurable through technology. The future of well-being is very precise, it's very personalized, it's very predictive, it's preventive, it's a process in which you can participate and the technology exists, including the technology that we call this handheld device. So, you know, I can do a video of yours um, 
uh, saying hello how are you i could capture this video look at your facial expressions tone of your voice your eye movements your gestures your body language and correlate that with your blood pressure your heart rate your immune system your hormones so that's the progress we've made in the last 30 years and you 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 said you're still teaching you're still practicing you're still a medical doctor i am i have a license in massachusetts a license in uh, california license in florida and i'm just renewing my license for new york city as well i i asked that because over the course of time when people have criticized you you still had a license that you couldn't have if you were just outwardly as they said like babble science what i'm saying is not considered unscientific anymore by by most people um you know people like wikipedia etc they have to catch up but uh, <laughs> But, but otherwise, in academic institutions, what I'm saying is not contested anymore. Is it validating to know that stuff that you've been saying for this many years is now being more accepted as mainstream? Uh, yeah, it is validating. But also, I listen to my intuition, even when we did not have the science. Coming up, it's interesting. But why do so many top celebrities look to him for guidance? They are very creative people, and they understand that creativity doesn't come from the mind; it comes from a deeper level. Tell us about this tour and why you decided to make New Jersey your stop, your only stop in the United States. Well, uh, first of all, my internship 53 years ago was in a hospital in New Jersey. Where I'm going to be discussing both the future of well-being and the awakened life. Um, the spiritual awakening, which is our next uh, phase of evolution as human beings. And from there, I'm going to California for a couple of days, and then onward to Egypt, and then to England, and then to Europe. And I'm also speaking about my last book, which is called Quantum Body, which takes the argument that I've presented over 30 years to the next level, explaining it through quantum science. What do people see when they come and sit down and, and get a chance to have you in their presence and answering questions and what have you? I think they get a few aha moments and some of them leave transformed and some of them leave uh, uh, with an intention for transformation. And a lot of people find uh, uh, some kind of solace in the idea that much of our well-being is in our own hands and that even old age infirmity and death do not have to be unpleasant. But I look at some of the people you've had a direct impact in and, and well-known names, the, the Lady Gagas, the Alicia Keys, the people like that. Uh, why do you think that they were on board first or before some others were willing to accept? Well, the people you mentioned, uh, Lady Gaga or Alicia Keys or Michael Jackson or Marlon Brando or others, they're very creative people. And they understand that creativity doesn't come from the mind. It comes from a deeper level uh, of the soul. And so they're aligned in this way of thinking already. And they just uh, find... Uh, some kind of confirmation of validity because I bring the science to them. And on another kind of personal note, I have uh, something called sarcoidosis and live with it for years. And I remember when I was first diagnosed, they just loaded me up on steroids and yes. I hated the way it made me feel. So I stopped taking them and I sought out, you know, this was 20 years ago, I sought out an alternative medicine uh, specialist who got me off of the steroids, and I've you know, done pretty well since then. I feel like that desire to get away from just being loaded up with medicine and trying to take control of your, uh, your life and well-being would lead people to folks like you. Has that kind of been your experience too? Yes, that is my experience. And we now know that things like good sleep and stress management and meditation and mindfulness and diet and biological rhythms and emotional resiliency all help in restoring what we call self-regulation or homeostasis, which is the technical word for healing. You have said in the past, or Wikipedia <laughs> said that you said in the past, so correct me if I'm wrong, 
that whole journey to, in quotes, attaining perfect health. Uh, and perfect health can be attained. Now tell me, one, if that's you know, Wikipedia science or if that is in fact the, the goal and the path that you have people on. Well, I'm 78 years old and I have no sickness. And uh, I'm, I think in perfect health, I don't have any aches and pains. I don't have any emotional issues or mental issues. I don't see why that shouldn't be applied to anyone else unless they have a genetically determined uh, fully penetrant gene, which is less than 5%. Uh, anybody has access to well-being and what I call perfect health. Coming up next, he's a doctor, a healer, an author, but now at this point, it's about so much more. I think if we had a critical mass of people engaged in what we call love in action, we could have a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. With someone who is accomplishing and has accomplished as much as you have, is there a what's next or is today what's yeah, that's next? That's my next book. There it's we called go. Digital, digital Dharma, how artificial intelligence can elevate spiritual intelligence and well-being. How do you do this? Like, how do you continue in so many evolving topics just continue to knock these books out. And they're not little thin books. Like This I, I is excessive. I keep up with what's happening in the world of science and philosophy. And then I get ideas and then I share them. Uh, you are very involved with, have worked with multiple people on several charities. You're always trying to heal people. Um, but why is expanding that and the additional charity so important to you? I think we need a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. And right now, our world is plagued with war, with terrorism, with social and racial injustice, with economic uh, injustice, with uh, climate change, and with uh, mechanized ways of killing each other. I think if we had a critical mass of people engaged in what we call love in action, we could have a more peaceful, just, sustainable, healthier, and joyful world. And that is what my nonprofit foundation uh, attempts to do. We work on mental well being, suicide prevention, conflict resolution, and also health and longevity. I think nonprofit work is very important, at least at my stage in life. I've been there, done that, walked the path of fame and fortune, and now it's my time to serve. You've been 17 in the world as influential thinkers, number one in the world for medicine and influential thinkers in the field of medicine. How do I get to be top 17 in the world in anything? By not having that ambition, just finding your passion, singing your song, and not worrying who listens, what they think. The theme of our show is the concept of use your voice for good. That seems to be something you've dedicated your life to. But when you hear the phrase, use your voice for good, what does that mean in your life? Am I enjoying myself doing what I'm doing? Am I working with people who are happy? And am I alleviating suffering in the world? If the answer is yes to these three things, I'm in. Guys, thanks so much for watching this episode of The Pulse with Dr. Deepak Chopra. That one was different, honestly, getting a chance to pick the brain of one of the most well-known, well-respected, and yet through the years, controversial figures, honestly, in history, was a pleasure for me. I enjoyed that opportunity, and I hope you did as well, both getting his knowledge as well as his explanation on how he's kind of done that. And he, and he fixed me in like, what, 30 minutes in commercials. I encourage you to check out the podcast, uninterrupted all places where podcasts are available you can hear the full discussion and i leave you today as i always do reminding you whenever you can use your voice for good and have a good one i feel all enlightened now